Uh, hey, as, as uh, you're probably aware, we've just got back from a holiday. We went to the Gold Coast. Now, funny thing, whenever you say you're going on a holiday, people, the first question people ask you is, where are you going? Exactly right, where are you going? And of course, well, we went to the Gold Coast and uh, spent some time up there. Our son got a job and our eldest boy has moved up to, uh, to start with a new accountancy firm up at the Gold Coast. And of course, when he told everybody that he's got a new job and he's moving, uh, the first question people asked him was, where are you going? This question is quite common. Where are you going? Where are you going? We were up there at the Gold Coast and we were, uh, one day we, we decided to go and get some pizzas, um, as you probably can tell. We, we went and got pizzas and me and Jackie were sitting in the car parked uh, at Southport there and we're waiting for the pizzas to be made and of course it's, it's, it's I think it's $744 per minute parking at Southport and give or take and so what we did is we jumped out, we ordered, we jumped in the car, we had to drive around so we drove around till we found um, a, a free parking place and because uh, we spent all our money on pizza, we didn't pay for parking as well, then, the, then that $5 Domino's pizzas become $40, it's not worth it, no value in that. Makes sense, doesn't it? So anyway, so we pulled over and we're sitting there, we're watching all these cars just flying by. As we're watching the cars going by, we made this, started to have this little conversation. Um, I wonder where they're all going. I wonder where they're going. All these cars buzzing past, all this myriad of people. And the question that crossed our mind was, I wonder where each and every one of them are going. Now, I'm hoping that they knew where they were going, otherwise they were just driving blindly and, and using up fuel. And, but I'm, I'm assuming that everybody that was driving knew where they were going. Well, this question's been buzzing around in my mind. Where are you going? Where are you going? And I want to ask you that question this morning. Where are you going? Not when you finish here. Some of you are going to go home and make your lunch. Some of you are going to go and visit a friend. Uh, some of you might hang out together and, and go and do stuff. Um, some of you might be heading off to work. Jackie's got to head off to work after the service this morning. But I'm talking with God. I'm talking spiritually. Where are you going? An interesting thing happened to us in March last year. Can anyone remember what that was? <laughs> we got hit with this thing called coronavirus. Now, just if I can throw this whole coronavirus kind of thing into a bit of a nutshell, here's something that happened. And you're all aware of this. We couldn't gather together. Do anyone remember that? We could not gather together anymore in meetings like this. And so we started the online stuff and people were meeting at home. And then when it, 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 we were opened up to gatherings of five, we encouraged people, just why don't you now meet in your home with five other people and watch the online stuff. And then it went to 10 and so on. And praise God, we're back in this place where we are now, where we're, we're able to gather back together because I think it's really important. One of the things that people missed the most through that time was the connection with others. You can get mouth-watering preaching online. What was that? You can get mouth-watering preaching online if you want to. You can get amazing worship by picking up a CD if you want to. But the thing we really missed was, was this, this gathering together. But what's interesting is as I've talked to other pastors and I, I listen to a lot of people, not just in the church here in Australia but overseas, and, and one thing that... that that struck me when we began to gather together was this. I even asked myself this question. Why do I want to go back there? Why do I want to go back there? I mean, I can get amazing teaching online and I can do it whenever I want. So Sunday morning, if I'm feeling a bit tired, hey, I can just put it on at night time. Uh, worship, I can get a worship CD. I can put three hours of Hillsong piano worship on my YouTube at home and get great worship if I want to. So why would I want to come back to a gathering? And that was a question that I think a lot of people, and maybe many of you here, you've asked yourself the same question. Why did I come back? Why would I want to come back? Now, I'll, I'll say this. Whatever God is doing here, I think he's doing something wonderful. It's not better than anywhere else, but I think he's doing something because the numbers that have come back since uh, has shown me that I'm hoping most of you have asked that question and you've come up with an appropriate answer, an answer that's led you to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to go back and, and join this particular place. But it did get me thinking as well about not only why would I go back there, but it got me thinking about where am I actually going with my walk with Jesus. And as a pastor, I've got to be honest, it began me thinking why would people want to come here and where are we going? What's the point of these spiritual gatherings we have called church? Why, why would you give up a Sunday morning to come? If it's to be entertained 
then we've probably failed in our mission. If Jesus was to stand here now and say to the leaders of, of these gatherings we call churches all around the country, why are you, what are you doing? What are you gathering them for? You see, we can run a really, really good Sunday service and we can put all our energy and focus into this hour and a half and just make it schmick and seamless and cool and look great. We could do that. But the question on your mind is, is that really going to set you up and me up where I walk with God for the other six and a half weeks, uh, days of the week? Is that going to equip us to stand up in a society that right now is running a mile from Christian values, running in the complete opposite to whatever, uh, uh, what, what, what Jesus stood for in the Christian worldview? Is it going to, are we getting to a place where we're being equipped to handle life there, or are we just coming, getting happy, um, learning more how to serve in the context of a church, maybe sweep a carpet, or what, what, what's this whole thing about? And in that process of thinking about that, I've had to go back and, and, and listen and read and learn and study and look at the letters, particularly the letters that this dude called Paul wrote in the New Testament. If you're not a, a, a Bible person here, um, th- this here is not a book. It's, I know we sell it as a book and it's regarded as the biggest selling book of all time, but it's actually not a book. In the pages of that are 66 ancient historical documents that were written over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents by about, I think it's 27 different authors. And they've been compiled. You think about that. What are the chances of that happening over that period of time and being compiled together and, and put in here? And sometimes even as believers, we lose, we lose the impact of what this is when we pick it up and read it. We read it like it's just a book. Yet this was written over 1,500 years, three continents, I think it was, 66 different, different books, and yet it tells one story that goes right across through the ages, a story about life before Jesus and a story about life after Jesus. The centre point of the whole story is Jesus Christ in a moment in human history where a man who claimed to be the Son of God was crucified on a cross. So what are we meeting for? What's the point When I go through and I look at all this stuff, I've come to a simple conclusion. I want to share it with you this morning. You can can call this a throwing vision. You can call it whatever you want. But I believe this is the point. This is the purpose of the the church. This This is the purpose of why we're here, why we exist. And this is your journey. So if you're a believer in Jesus, I'm going to point out to you what your journey is. And if you are not a believer in Jesus and you're here, guess what? I think this is your journey too. And so I want to go through four stages of this journey that I believe I've just summed it down to one word. Now, here's what I'm going to do in the coming weeks. I'm going to get these four words on some kind of flag or banner or something. It's going to look really cool, trust me. And I'm going to stick them around here. And I want us to get to the point that whenever we see that word, we can associate what stage of the journey of faith that that word relates to and where we are on that journey. Um, it, it, It says, let me put my glasses on here, in... Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes this, and I won't go, I just want to read the first half of the verse. He said, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Let me move, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and let us go forward onto maturity. Now, we've always said to you the name of this church is what we call this gathering is Arise. Uh, Arise is a prophetic statement about what we believe we're called to, to agitate for. And that is that we would stand up, that we would grow up, that we would move forward, that we would be people that go to a place of maturity, not just sit there and go, gee, that was a fun message, gee, that worship was, was great, and then go home, eat our chicken sandwiches and forget about God for the rest of the week. God is front and centre of our entire life. And what Paul's saying here is that there's a journey that you are on. Hear the journey language. Therefore, let us move. We're going somewhere beyond. In other words, we're moving, we're going beyond where we are. We're in a place right now, but we need to go past that place onto something else. He said, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. The landing place is Christian maturity. That's where he wants us to land. But we all have a starting point and an ending point. And... When you go into a shopping centre, let's say you go into a big shopping centre in Brisbane and you want to go to JB Hi-Fi, right? And I use this illustration with a few people. I can't tell you how to go to JB Hi-Fi at Chermside Shopping Centre in Brisbane. I can't tell you that because I don't know what entrance you walked into. 
So in order, to, in order for you to know how to get to where you need to go, you need to know where you currently are right now. And so I want you to think about that concept as I go through these four words and try to just expand a little bit and tell you what I mean by each of these phrases. And if you can put the first slide up there, Luke, the four phrases are this, faith, freedom, focus, and fruit. Now, I believe those four words, they sum up this Christian journey. Anybody that, that follows Jesus or, or is looking uh, for life in God, I want you to look at those four words, faith, freedom, focus, and fruit, because they summarize this journey of life, this spiritual journey that each and every one of us are on. Let me just break it down now. So the first one's faith. Faith is about knowing God. And if you're in this place and you know Jesus, then you have, you've, you've been to that station. You've stopped there and you've met God. You've had an encounter with God, the reality of God. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't come to that place yet of actually knowing God. Well, let me encourage you that God is real, that God is not a philosophy. He's not a theory. But, but Jesus was a tangible historical person who made some pretty amazing claims. Nobody in human history has made claims like Jesus and backed it up the way that Jesus Christ did. So if you're here and you've never looked into this Christian faith, you've never looked into the reality of Jesus, can I encourage you when a man says that your future eternity hinges on what you do with me, I think it's worth checking out just in case, don't you? Just in case he's right. A lot of people will look me in the eye and say that, that Christianity is not true and, and they don't believe in God. Why? Because I heard a 10-minute TED Talk one day and somebody disproved it. You can't disprove anything of value in 10 minutes. Look into it. Just in the same way that you can't prove anything with a 10-minute TED Talk. Read, study, ask questions and so on. You know, I meet a lot of young people and a lot of young people will say this to me. I'll talk to them about their faith journey and they'll use this phrase, I'm just working it out. I'm just working it out. So then I'll ask this question. Okay, you're just working it out. That's fine. Do you go to a Christian gathering at all? No? Okay, that's fine. Do you read a Bible, this set of ancient documents that speak about God? Do you pick it up and read it on any occasion? No? Okay, so you don't hang out with anyone that, that knows God, that's, that's got a journey and a walk with God. You don't talk to those people that are on the other side that could give you some insight and understanding. You don't read the book that it's all based on our faith is, is kind of built around the teachings of this. Do you pray? Do you ever sit down and quiet yourself and say, God, if you're really there, would you reveal yourself to me? No, I don't do that either. Well, let me burst your bubble. You're not checking nothing out. I want to play squash again. Look at me. I'm an athlete. I should be playing more sport. Now, I just went away on a holiday, and anyone lost any weight over the holidays? Anyone here say that? Mick, I found it. It's right here. You can have it back when you want it. I packed it on. I want to play squash, but you know what I've had to do in order to play squash in this town? I've got to find out where a squash centre is, and they've got to research. Then I've got to go to that squash centre and check it out and talk to whoever runs it and find out when the competitions are. There are logical steps that I take when I'm checking something out. So if you're a young person here, let me encourage you, if you don't put time aside, pray and ask God the question. If you don't talk to people who know the stuff, who are walking with Jesus, and ask those questions, nothing wrong with the questions you have, but ask the questions. Don't try to work them out and you're, ask somebody the questions. When Mick was building the stage, I asked Mick questions. Um, you know, how do you bend wood? How do you do all this stuff? What do you do with it? I, I, I could have well and truly made that stage myself, probably done a well, it wouldn't have been a better job, actually. I just wanted a square box to stand on. Mick said, no, we're going to do this and make it like that. And now our stage is the talk of the Christian world. People remember a rise more for the stage than my preaching. Gee, that was a good, that stage, though, you should say that stage. It's awesome. But you ask questions. If you're not asking questions, you're not picking up this book. I don't want to burst your bubble, but just be honest, you're not searching. Here's what Jesus had to say about faith. He said in John 17, 3, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you. Now let me give you a little insight into the Greek concept of knowledge. Greek knowledge was not about information. It was about experience. This is eternal life, that you would experience God. 
God is not just a bunch of head knowledge. It's the same word that's used if you go back and we all know the Christmas story of, of, of this guy called Joseph finding out that his wife is having a baby. And it says that Joseph was shocked at this. Why? Because Joseph never knew her. That's what it says. He never knew her. It's the same word. It's the same word they use for knowing. He never knew her. In other words, he did not have an intimate encounter with her. This is eternal life, that you would encounter God. You encounter God through attending a meeting like this. You encounter God through talking to people that know God. You encounter God through getting into the pages of this book. You encounter God through prayer. Most of all, you encounter God by doing what God says. And then God comes through with a result and you go, wow, that actually works. Duh, he's the king of the universe. He knows a thing or two about life. The first stop on this journey, Christian journey, is to know God. And if you don't know God here, then I'm going to ask you at the end of this meeting if you want to get to know God. Because it's not a process, it's not a class, it's a moment in time where you open your heart up and you admit that, yeah, I, I've taken the reins of my own life and I've done my best, I can't do it. That's the point God wants you at. I've, I've broken your laws, I haven't lived the way you want me to. God wants you to get to that place of acknowledging that, then he comes on in and he takes over and he does amazing things. 19 years of age I was, hopeless, depressed. I cried out to God on a roundabout at the Pacific Highway with trucks and buses going around me. I wasn't in a building, I wasn't being spiritual or holy. I just woke up one day, 19 years of age, rock bottom, and knew that I needed something and had an inkling that maybe God was the answer. And so I cried out to him and God met me in that moment. Here I am, 30 something, I don't know, I'm not good at maths, around 30 years later. And I can tell you that God is real and God is awesome. You know, on holidays, I've got to get this off my chest. I've got to confess something to you on. I don't want to be judged for it. I did something on holidays that I'm not proud of. I'm just going to be humble. Um, if you're watching this online, don't judge me either. I read Cameron Smith's autobiography. <laughs> I have changed. I read Cameron Smith's autobiography. You know what that means? Well, it means I know a lot more stuff about Cameron Smith, but I don't know Cameron Smith. I still don't know Cameron Smith. I've never encountered Cameron Smith. I just know a lot of stuff about him. This is eternal life that you would know, not know stuff about, but that you would open up your world and you would live in an encounter with God. Let him come into your life. That's faith. That's the first part of the journey. The second one is freedom. Second word there is freedom. You want to whack that up for me? Freedom. Freedom, as the word suggests, is about getting free. Anyone ever seen that movie, The Bourne Identity? Anyone seen those Jason Bourne films? How cool are they? Don't judge me if you don't think they're cool. Um, but I, I just think they're great. The, the concept of that series of films is awesome. Here's a guy who is found floating face up in an ocean by some strangers. And they put him in the boat. And he wakes up. And they start working on his wounds and cuts and everything. And he begins to come to. And then something just tweaks as the journey goes on. And he realizes, you know what? I don't really know who I am. And so... The, this movie goes through a series of events where Jason Bourne begins to discover who he really is. Who he really is. Let me tell you something about life. Until I came to Christ, the world was shaping me a certain way. I had things happen in my life, disappointments and hurts and, and a whole bunch of events and stuff that was geared towards shaping me. How many of you know that you went through things as a child and they, start, they got you believing certain things about the world? And maybe they got you believing certain things about yourself. You know, like the elephant. Anyone heard the, what they do with the circus elephants, how they train them? When the elephant's really tiny, they, they, they get a big stake and they put it in the ground and they tie a chain from the stake to the leg of the elephant and the little elephant tries to walk away, but he can't because he can't pull the stake out of the ground. And he does this time after time and after a while he realizes, I can't pull the stake out of the ground, so he stops trying. One day he becomes a three-ton mammoth beast that if he wanted to could just flick his leg like that and that thing's coming out and he can run. But he doesn't even try to do it. Why? Because he was trained to think that he never could. And so he's believing something about himself. He's believing he's an animal that can't get away from that peg in the ground. 
because he's been trained to think that way. But what's the reality? He could get away from that if he wanted to. And here's what I found in my journey with God, and you probably found in yours too. God wants us to get free of that kind of stuff. He wants us to break free of wrong thinking about ourselves, about the world around us, about who he is. So many people have wrong concepts and ideas about who God is, that he's this judge that's sitting up there looking. He's deliberately looking for one thing, and that is for you to fail. Why? Because he gets so much joy pulling his rod out and smacking people. I was at a a football game once, and I'm sitting next to this guy, and we're having this conversation, and and he says this to me. He, 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 He finds out that I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus, and he shares this story with me. He says, you know what? When I was a kid, I used to live, uh, I was an orphan. I lived in a monastery uh, uh, convent with the nuns that watched over us, and and when I was a 10-year-old boy and I would wet my bed, the nun would come in with a stick, and she would belt me with a stick, and then he stopped, and he just looked at me. What he was saying to me was, that's who God is. God belts 10-year-old kids with a stick. Here's a guy that would have been at that stage. I reckon he was in his 40s. And he's telling me, what's he saying? He's saying, that's who God is. See, that's not who God is. You've got to break free from that, brother. You've got to break free from that. God wants to change that picture, that perspective, that image. Some of us have been told things about ourselves, and it becomes so embedded in us. And here's the thing. Stage number one on the journey, we get to know God. When we come to know God, what does God want to do? The next stop on the station is start getting free. God wants to get in amongst that stuff in our world and set us free so that we can have the life that he wants us to have uninhibited and free. Amen? Many people in this room, you've had stuff that go, that's gone on in your life that's been geared towards setting you free. You know, sometimes we resist that, don't we? Because this, this is that part of the journey where we're most vulnerable and where it takes the most humility. It's that part of the journey where we begin to take off the mask that we wore our whole life, creating this image of who we were, and now all of a sudden we're starting to peel that mask off through vulnerability, through humility, and allowing God into those places. And even now while I'm saying this, maybe there are some people sitting in you, you know there's some things in your life where you know you need to get free. And you got, well, maybe that's where you are on this journey right now. You're at that place. And God's, God's call to you for this phase of your life is, you know what, you need to get free. Maybe you need to do a course. Maybe you need to read a book. Maybe, may, maybe you need to talk to a spiritual leader. Maybe you need to go beyond that. Maybe you need some professional help. Maybe you need to talk to a psychologist or a counsellor or something like that. Pastors are not psychologists and counsellors. We deal with spiritual things. We don't deal with everything. Don't, please don't ever think that we know the answers to every problem. And if you come to us and we get to a point where we can't help you, we'll not hesitate to say, we can't help you. You need to go look elsewhere because we're, we're mini Jesuses, but not in that way. <laughs> Just as you're a mini Jesus, Christians, like Christ. Getting free. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I love this, let us throw off a couple of the things that hinder us. Does it say that? It says, no, 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 this journey is about let's learn to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily ensnares, not just talking about sin, talking about all kinds of things, anything that holds us back. And I love this. Why do we got to throw all that stuff off? Well, he tells us, he says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. There's a race marked out for you, and God wants you to run that race. And the things that slow you down and hold you back, he wants to set you free from that stuff so that you can run. Bruce Springsteen got it right when he said... Baby, you were born to run. I thought in that moment in my mind that everyone would know that song and I wouldn't have to do what I just did and sound like a git. But anyway, I did. And that's okay. You were born to run. And God wants you to run and, and God wants to set us free from those things that hold us back from running and being the person that he wants us to be. Number three, the third word up there is focus. So God wants us to know him. He wants us to find faith. Then when we come to faith, what he wants us to do is to get free, find freedom, let him deal with the stuff that's there that's holding us back. Why deal with all that stuff? Because the more we deal with that stuff, the more I become the person I was created to be so I can do what I was put here to do. Focus is about finding your purpose. You're not here by accident. If you're in this room this morning, you can sit here and go, it's random chance, I could have been here, done that or whatever. I I don't believe necessarily that as much of life is random chance as we think it is. Now, I'm not one of these guys that goes, you know, I squashed a fly right now. That was the eternal will of God and he knew the fly was going to go past. I'm not going to that extreme. But what I'm saying is this, that I believe if you're here today, I believe that you're meant to be here. You're meant to be hearing this. 
You're meant to be hearing this. You could have done a whole bunch of other things. When it comes to your spiritual condition and eternity, I don't believe that God takes chances. I believe God is very deliberate and strategic. And if you're here, you're here for a reason. Number three that on, on that journey is focus. We need to find our purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Wow. Let that sink in for a second. You're not just a bunch of molecular things that bang together one day. You're not just a man and a woman who came together and a sperm and an egg met. You're the handiwork of God. You're the handiwork of God. It's, it's like ever, anyone ever seen someone on a potter's wheel sitting there and they're working that clay and they're turning that into something majestic and beautiful. That's what you and I are. We are the handiwork of God. You're custom built. How's that? You're not, just a, you're not a Toyota Camry. They just mass produce those things and they just chuck them out and sell them. They mass produce. You're not a Toyota Camry. You might drive a Toyota Camry, but Rod, you are not a Toyota Camry. You're a custom built machine designed. Now, 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 watch this bit. We are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared when? In advance. So here's the deal. God prepared these things that he wanted done first. Then he went, how am I going to do this? I'm going to need a certain type of thing. I'm going to have to make that certain type of thing. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to make a Jackie because Jackie fits that particular thing that was created first. It says that the works were created before you were. Think about that. Do you want any more self-affirmation? You are custom built for a purpose. When a guy first banged a nail, there was a, 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 a piece of wood and he had this thing called a nail and he put it up and he said with his hands and it wouldn't go in, he's pushing with his thumb, he goes, gee whiz, we got these things called wood and if you put them together with these skinny bits of metal called nails, we can really get this job done quicker. But how do we get them in? Look at them, we got the nails. Then someone said, I oh, know, why don't we make a thing called a hammer? So the hammer was designed to fulfill a task, and that task was to bang a nail in. What came first, the hammer or the, or the The task was there first. Somebody wanted to move dirt from there to there. They said, this is getting really tiring, sending my wife and children out to do it. They're not doing it quick enough. I need some implement. Oh, why don't we come up with a pointy bit of metal called a shovel, and if we do that, we can move it a lot quicker. Here, wife, here, kids, take the shovel out and do it. She didn't take it out. She snuck up behind him with the shovel. You're created for a purpose. And the third part of this journey is number one, know God. Second one, get free. And then we need to find our purpose. You know, I've got this little thing at home and I'm, I'm going to humble myself again before you. I was in the Solomon Islands on a, an island called Savo Savo many, many years ago. It was a volcanic island, beautiful island. And we were doing some work with some churches over there. It would have been probably early 20s, I reckon. <laughs> and... One of the kids is running around in the bush and he screams and all the kids go running into the bush and he comes out and he's holding this little thing. And then one of the villagers proceeds to tell me, oh, I think that's an exploded grenade from World War II. I thought, wow, that's a cool find. And he says, yeah, we find them all the time. And I went, oh, can I have that one? He said, yeah. So I got it and I got some petrol and everything and I sort of cleaned it up and that and I, I, I flew back to Australia and I treasured it and I, I went through customs. I, I, I even declared it at customs and showed them and, and they said, no, that's okay, you can take it. And I had it for years and about a year ago I thought, what I'm going to do is take it down to the war memorial thing in, in Balna there on the river. I'm going to give it, I'm going to donate it to them and they can, you know, because I've just got it hanging around. And then it might have been Mick actually, maybe it was Mick, about... 12 months ago, I showed it to somebody, and I think it may have been Mick now that I'm thinking about it. And I showed it to Mick, and there might have been another person there, and I'm saying, oh, look at this. And they said, oh, where'd you get that? And I said, oh, it's an exploded grenade. And they said to me, actually, it's not. It's a float from a petrol thing. Um. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I was going to take that down to the War Memorial. I am so glad that I found out what it was for before it was too late. Wouldn't you love to find out what you're for before it's too late? Wouldn't you love to know what your purpose is and what you really are and why you are put here before it's too late? Amen? Number four. Whack the fourth one up there for me, can you? Uh, please. Look. Number four. Fruit. Fruit is about making a difference. So here's your spiritual journey. Faith. Get to know God. Freedom. 
Let God deal with this stuff in your life so that you can rediscover who you are, your identity, your gifts, your talents, your skills. Focus. Find out what am I here for? How do I put all that together? And then number five is when you start doing that, you start to become fruitful. You start to become fruitful. It's amazing when I read a lot of the parables of Jesus. I hear people say all the time, there's this, this battle, we're, we're just called to be faithful. And I think, you know what, there's a, there's a reality to that. Yeah, we're called to be faithful, but I also believe that when we're faithful, we're fruitful. Uh, I love the parable of the talents, uh, Matthew 25, where, 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 where the, 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 the landowner comes and he gives two, uh, two, uh, one and two and five talents to these people, gives them some money. And then he goes away and then he comes back. What's interesting about that is that when he came back, there must have been some expectation that what he had given to them, what they knew they were given, they knew what it was, what was given to them was used for something that would build into his bank account. Because when he came back, he was excited about the ones that had done something. And the one who did nothing, in other words, the one who was unfruitful, he wasn't overly excited about. There's something about fruitfulness. And I believe that we're called to be fruitful with the gifts and the talents and the life that God has given us. And by that, I don't mean fruitful in the sense that everybody go, oh, I'll clean a church or I'll make coffee. It's not about what goes on here for an hour and a half. Although all those things are great and you know we, 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 we need people doing all that stuff. But I wonder how many books are there to be written? that will help explain the deep issues of life to a generation of teenagers who right now are growing up with no solid foundation because nothing's real anymore. I wonder if there's somebody in here, you've got that book in you. I wonder if there are songs to be written that will speak to the hearts of broken-hearted men and women and point them to something more stable than the girlfriend or the boyfriend that they just got the flick from and they think that the world's going to end. I wonder if there are people in here with businesses that could solve problems such as, as hunger in nations or provide water to places in the world where people just don't get water. I wonder how much is sitting here in this room, if we could spiritually bring a big magnifying glass down right now and, and, and say, God, shine it on all of us and tell us what the future looks like if we all embrace who we are get free get focused on what god has has given to us and then we turn around and we give it back to you for the building of the kingdom of god not just the building of our own kingdoms here on earth i wonder i just wonder what life could look like when we start being fruitful we've moved from being consumers to being contributors to the kingdom of god You know the difference? A consumer lives their life. They wake up in the morning and they say, God, what have you got to give me today? God, what have you got to contribute towards my kingdom here on earth today? Towards my comfort, towards my satisfaction, towards my bank account? God, what have you got to give towards my image? What have you got to give towards my fame and popularity? Fruitful people wake up and they go, God, what can I give today? To the building of your fame and your kingdom and your popularity and your plans and your purposes. So there you have it. A spiritual journey that I believe all of us go on. Luke, you want to go back to that first slide for me, mate? Faith. Get to know God. Maybe you're here and you don't know God. Then I want to say to you, that's, that's your point. I want you to explore the teachings of Jesus and I want you to think seriously and ask questions about eternal life because I believe that there's a God in heaven and I believe that one day every one of us whether we believe in him or not will stand before him and give an account for our life that's what I believe based on my life experience my study my prayer my research my reading that's what I believe maybe you've gone through that maybe here and you've moved beyond that well the next one is freedom have you embraced the freedom that God has to offer are there areas of your world that you know the Holy Spirit puts his finger on but you just keep on clamming up and going no I don't want to go there no I don't want to go there you know why he wants to set you free because he wants to give you something that's so amazing he wants to give you a hope and a future that's why he wants to set you free he's not wanting to expose you to embarrass you belittle you he knows that if you will just humble yourself be vulnerable and walk into those places of freedom what's on the other side is way greater and the people that do that always look back and go I can't believe I hung on to that for so long when this was what was on offer all the time maybe you're at that station if that's you then that's your part of life right now get free you know those areas seek out freedom seek out uh, places and, and ways that you can break uh, allow God to break that stuff off your life maybe you feel you've moved beyond that maybe maybe your station right now is focus 
Maybe you're, you're that person that's going, right, I, I, I really want to uh, uh, find out, I, I want to find out how my skill set, my gifts, maybe you don't know your gifts, maybe there are a, a spiritual gift, um, things you can do and personality stuff you can do. Get to know yourself a little bit so that you know how you fit, you know how you operate, you know how you work. So that you can get focused on that thing and find that thing, what am I put here to do on planet Earth? And then maybe you know that, well, maybe the challenge for you is you go to the next station, you've got to start doing something with it. Start producing some fruit with it. I wonder if the disciples, Matthew 28, when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, I wonder if it crossed their mind at all. Okay, well, we were fishing one day and Jesus called us and we, we, we found faith. We've been hanging out with Jesus for a long time. He's been teaching us and doing things and we've found freedom. We now feel free in Christ. He's, he's spoken to us and he's made it very clear to us, this is what I want you to do. You're going to go into all the known world and I want you to tell people about the reality of who I am, what I've done and how I've set you free and how I've saved you and how it's not just for the Jewish people, it's for all nations. So they got focus. I wonder if when Jesus said now, time to produce fruit, go into all the world, I wonder if it crossed their mind to go, mm, don't really have to do that bit, do we? I mean, we've we're, 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 we're got faith. You know, praise God, we're people of faith, we've got faith. Woo-hoo-hoo! Go on to heaven. Go on to heaven. I'm free. All the shackles are broken. You know, I can dance. I'm focused. I know what he wants us to do. I know that he's called us to go and take the... Ah, oh, isn't this great? No, no. They then had to move into the next place and go and do it and produce a bit of fruit in their life. I wonder where you are on those four stations. Here's what I want to say to you. I believe that part of our commitment as a gathering here at Arise is to facilitate people on that journey. That's what we exist for. That's what we exist for. And over the next 12 months, we're going to be looking at everything that we do here and the courses we run and the programs and the things, and we're going to look at each of those areas and go, how are these things helping people move from faith to freedom or from freedom to focus or from focus to fruit? That's what we're going to do. That's our commitment to the people that call this place home. That's what we believe God's saying to us. That's why Rise exists. Not so you can stop at a station, but so you can get off there and do what needs to be done to get back on that train and get to that next place. Because we live in a world, we live in a world that is getting further and further and further and further and further and further and further further away. And we live in a church world that values convenience over conviction. We live in a church world that wants comfort. I'm, I'm just being brutally honest with you. We live in a church world that doesn't like challenge. We live in a church world that just wants an hour and a half to be enough. I want to tell you this, the church doesn't have a world. It's either Jesus or it's nothing. And we're just a part of that. Amen? If you're here this morning, why don't you close your eyes for a second. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus at all. Maybe you want to get to know God. When I prayed to God, I didn't have all the answers. 19 years of age, all I knew was this. There's more to this life than I can see, taste, touch, smell and feel. And it doesn't matter which world religion you look at, Jesus is there in their lineage somewhere. I wonder why. Well, they can't get rid of him because he is real. So everybody has to include him somewhere in their less great teachers or gurus. If you're here this morning and that's you and you, 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 just, you want to open your heart up and you want to say, God, I've done it my way. It doesn't work. Lord, I'm sorry. I want you to come take control of my life. If that's you, I just want you to throw your hand in the air. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out the front. It's between you and God. It's got nothing to do with me or anybody else. If that's you, just throw your hand in the air. It's just an action of faith to let God know. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's just your way of saying to God, God, I'm serious about this. Here I am. Have a look. Come and do something. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, I want to pray, God, for that person here this morning. Lord, we just... Pray, God, as they've raised their hands, Father, to acknowledge their need for you, that, Holy Spirit, you would move in that person's life in this place right now. And, uh, Lord, just continue to take that person on this journey, Father. I pray that you would give that person faith, courage to open their mouth and to ask questions and to continue on the journey of learning, Father, that you have them on. And, God, for each and every one of us, the rest of us here, Lord, I pray that in 2021 that we would take seriously faith freedom, focus, and fruit. That, God, we would have a look and see where we are on that journey, that we would be committed, Father, to knowing you, that we would be committed to getting free, 
that we'd be committing, committed to, to finding our purpose and that we would make a commitment to being fruitful and actually making a difference as well, Father. And I pray that over the life of every person in this room right now. And God, as we go from here this morning too, Lord, I pray in the next seven days, would you give everybody in this room that knows you, everyone that has bowed their knee to you, God, give every person here the opportunity to tell somebody outside that doesn't know you how much you care for them, how much you love them, and how special they are to you, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.